All right, guys, so welcome to our first video to actually cover some content, okay? Just an introduction to, to kind of get the course started, okay? So here is like a general view of what is usually covered in phonetics and phonology books, books okay? So we can see that among the features of pronunciation, and here we, we're mixing phonetics, phonology, and pronunciation. Little by little, these terms are going to get... Uh, familiar to you all, but uh, you see that one of the purposes of this course is applied. So we're not going to see phonetics and phonology just for the sake of theory, but we're going to try to apply it to pronunciation, and in this case, pronunciation of English, okay? So usually those materials and, and the material that I share with you, the books that I share with you, they usually cover these areas, okay? So uh, we're, we usually begin with segmental features, and segmental here means uh, uh, units like consonants and vowels, okay? So we're going to begin uh, very soon looking at consonants and vowels, and we're going to see uh, these characteristics of consonants being either voiced or unvoiced or voiceless. We're going to look at uh, single vowels first, and then diphthongs. We're going to talk about triphthongs as well. We're going to see various classifications of vowels, not only short and long, or tense and lax, which would be a better terminology, but we're going to see several classifications. Don't worry, okay? This is just like a general view, okay? And there is also suprasegmental features or prosodic features, okay? Such as intonation, which has to do with the melody of the language, stress, which has to do with emphasizing certain parts, okay? And within stress, we can talk about sentence stress, word stress. Uh, we're gonna talk about other features of connected speech, uh, such as putting sounds together, losing sounds, changing sounds, and so on, okay? This is like a general overview of what uh, these manuals, these books usually cover, okay? But what, what I'd like to do for this first session is give you some expectations of goals for the course, okay? And to begin talking about these goals, I want to very briefly talk about the difference between acquiring the sounds of your native language and then acquiring the sounds of new languages, okay? So what happens when you're learning, you're acquiring your first language as a baby? What happens is that when you're a baby, you're hearing these sounds, noises, and your brain first needs to learn to distinguish what is speech sounds and what is not. And the brain does this very easily. Right, So there, there is research that shows that babies in the womb already can, can already recognize the voice of their mothers, right? So it's incredible how the brain uh, very soon starts picking up uh, speech and how speech sounds are different from sounds that are not related to speech, okay? Now, the thing is that when you're acquiring your first language, you don't know which how different the sounds need to be to convey meaning, right? For example, in Portuguese, we know that there is a difference between e and e, right? So if you say an o and o, right? So if you say vo and if you say vo, there is a difference. It's two different words. But when you're a baby, you, you don't really know if this difference is a huge difference in your native language so that these two sounds are going to be used for different words, or if they're just variations of the same sound, right? Because stop and, and think about it for a moment. Imagine you take 10 random Brazilians and you record them saying the same word, say the word ilha, okay? The word in Portuguese, ilha. Suppose you record 10 different people saying this word. And then you cut only the first sound, E. Do you think that the sound of this vowel E from 10 different Brazilians, do you think that this sound is going to be the same across all the speakers? No, of course not, right? People have different 
uh, uh, voice qualities, right? So some people speak with a higher pitch, some people with a lower pitch. Some vowels are going to be longer because people speak more slowly. Some are going to be short because people speak fast. And, uh, and, and, and there are all types of differences, okay? If you record the same person saying the same words at different times, uh, it's, it's very likely that each uh, rendition of, of the vowel is going to be slightly different from the other. Now, when we acquire our first language, we learn uh, just by listening to the language that these small variations don't really matter, but some uh, stronger variations do matter. So changing from e to e or from o to o matters in Portuguese but not in Spanish, for instance. So Spanish speakers learning Portuguese, they have a hard time distinguishing between vo and vo, for instance, right? You may think, oh, but how come the difference is so strong? How come they, they, they have a hard time uh, perceiving this difference? Well, it's the same for Brazilians learning English, right? So I gave you the example of the, wor the word ilha in Portuguese, right? So from listening to Portuguese from, from when we're born on, we, we learned that it doesn't matter if you say ilha or ilha or ilha or ilha or variations of this e, you're going to hear the same word. You're going understand to understand the same word, right? Now, in English, if you say e or if you say e, it may change the meaning of the word, right? So you have pairs like leave and live, seat and sit, keep and keep, right? So these words, they have different meanings and you're just changing E. For Brazilians, it's such a small difference, right? You may think, oh, but come on, it's just the detail. How come these two sounds are different? But for English speakers, from listening to their language and acquiring this system, for them, that's a huge difference, right? And then English speakers learning Portuguese, for instance, they have a hard time with nasal sounds. So for them, a difference between pau and pão is very hard to perceive and to produce. And for us, it's such a huge, dif huge difference, right? So when we're acquiring our first language, our brain when we were babies, right? In the first, first year of life, babies are listening, listening, listening. And when they are close to one year of age, they start saying their first words, right? And then they learn how to cope with this variation in what they're hearing, right? And we learn that some small variations, we should put, we should put all these small variations in one same category. And when we change too much within our language, we create a new category. So for instance, with the vowels in, in Portuguese, from just listening to our language, we create seven different categories for oral vowels in stressed position in Portuguese. We create a category for E, one for E, E, A, O, O, and U, okay? Now, in English, there are at least 11 categories for vowels. In Spanish, there are only five. In Japanese, there are only three. So here is the difficulty in acquiring the sounds of a second language. When you learn your second language, you need to either expand uh, your categories, right? So if, if you're coming from Portuguese to English, where you had seven vowels, you need to create new categories. Or if you're coming from a language with more categories, you're going to have to... Uh, uh, put more than one category in the, in the larger one, okay? So what makes it difficult to learn the sounds of a second language is not really our ability to, to hear things or to produce things, but it's the fact that we have learned our native language so well. We have learned to make these automatic associations of small variations so well that when we, learn a, we, we need to learn a second language and these small variations are actually large variations, we need to create these new categories, okay? So this is part of what we're going to do in this course, okay? We're going to create new categories for English sounds, where in Portuguese there are only few categories, okay? And there are many factors that affect the pronunciation of a second language, so personality, exposure, uh, uh, age, there are many factors, okay? Uh, 
But there are two that I believe are essential, especially for undergraduate students like yourselves. One is exposure. So you need to get exposed to the language. So you need to listen to English and watch things in English as much as possible. Another one that is not here is motivation, right? So the more motivated you are, the more curiosity you have, the more effort you put into learning the language. So these, are, these are, I believe, are two uh, very strong factors that will affect uh, the acquisition of pronunciation, okay? Now, one question that needs to be addressed in, in, in teaching and learning the pronunciation of a second language is what model to learn, to teach and to learn, right? So if, if, if you think of English, you have options, right? So the industry, the, the publishers, right, book publishers, they usually divide the English-speaking world into two categories only, American English and British English. And as I'm going to show you, this is a very simplistic division, right? If you think of native varieties of English, there are so many more, right? There is Australian English, New Zealand English, South African English, Canadian English, Hawaiian English, Irish, Scottish. There are so many, right? And there are also non-native varieties of English, right? So Brazilians speak English and with this specific accent, Japanese do to Chinese, Argentine. So there are many non-native varieties of English. So which one to learn, right? Now, this, this, this division of American and British English is also simplistic <clears throat> because within American English, we can't say there is only one variety called American English or one variety called British English. Think of the same division that uh, book publishers do with Portuguese. They usually divide the materials and courses and so on into Brazilian Portuguese and European Portuguese. But think of Brazilian Portuguese alone. Can we, can we say that there is one variety of Brazilian Portuguese that is the variety of Brazilian Portuguese? Which one is it? From Sao Paulo, from Rio, but where? There isn't, right? There are so many varieties that it's hard to say that there is one called Brazilian Portuguese. The same happens with American English and British English, okay? So I want to raise this problem and then give you what I think is uh, uh, the way to go, the path to go, okay? So I'm going to illustrate this using some videos, all right? And the first one I want to show you is a, a, a little video clip of a movie. Uh, RP stands for received pronunciation. It's the uh, what's supposed to be the standard pronunciation from London, okay, in, in England. And I'm going to show you this little snippet of this uh, movie uh, just to, for you to see that uh, it, it isn't as calling one type of English British English isn't as simple as it looks, okay? So here we go. Spot a bother up at Elroy Farm. Old Arthur Webley's been clipping hedgerows that don't belong to him. Yes, sir. That's it. Yes, sir. Why do we need the dog? <laughs> it's not the dog we need. Right. What did he say? Said as his head, eh? He only chopped him down because he couldn't see the view no more. What's he going to do? What did he say? He said an edge is an edge. He only chopped it down because it's for his view. What's he from learning about? Right. Look, I appreciate your position, Mr. Webley, but you can't go around chopping down other people's hedges without permission. Ah, no. Ah, suppose. Yes, I suppose. Thank you. All right. All, All right. right. Mr. Webley, I trust you have a license for that firearm. I don't know this one. He does for this, sir. He does for this one. What do you mean by this one? All right, so as, as you could see in that movie clip, you have three people speaking British English, but they need translators and interpreters, right? So the, the first police officer can't understand the farmer, so he needs two interpreters, right, to interpret from one dialect to the other. And all this... In the same area, right? In what um, um, book publishers would call British English. Okay, let me give you one more example with another video snippet. 
Oh, it's an, a new one, this one, okay. The UK is incredibly diverse in terms of accents, and it just so happens that I can do many of these accents as my party trick. So come with me as I take you on a guided tour through all of the accents and archetypes of Great Britain. Hi, I'm Siobhan Thompson, and this is Anglophenia. And what I'm speaking right now is RP, Receive Pronunciation, or, you know, your standard BBC English. It's spoken across the country, generally by middle, upper middle, and upper class people. Think of Martin Freeman, Benedict Cumberbatch, or, you know, most of the presenters of BBC News. So, good evening. It's nine o'clock, and this is the news. I'm very important. Heightened RP is generally only spoken on film and television now. So you're going to think of Noel Card or the Dowager Countess in Downton Abbey. Oh, Gerald, I do love you, but you're so terribly, terribly poor. Now, London is the accent that most people outside of Britain can recognise. You know, that classic lock, stock and two smoking barrels. Go out of my pub. Go on, go out of it. Shut it, you tart. East Anglia is a flat, boggy kind of place with a flat, boggy kind of accent. I'd love to give you an example of somebody that comes from there that speaks like this, but they all lose this accent as soon as they can. Stephen Fry's from Norfolk, but he doesn't speak like this because he's posh. Here's a kind of classic kind of East Anglia phrase. I done drop my computer in the fan and it's broken. Now let's go across the island to the West Country, which is a much rounder sound. It's farmland full of sheep and cows and apples. Think of like Sam Ganji from The Lord of the Rings or Hagrid from the Harry Potter movies. Oh, you bloody kids, get off my land! Or, oh, Mr. Frodo, don't let him turn me into anything unnatural. And then when you go down to Cornwall, it gets a little bit more piratey. So, hoist the mizzen mast, Squire Trelawney. Now, Southern Welsh is this great sing-songy kind of an accent. Think of Tom Jones or Richard Burton. You know, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Bloody hell, I love Dylan Thomas. Northern Welsh is where the singer Duffy is from. It's a breathier, thicker kind of an accent. And most people from there speak Welsh at home and English is a second language. So, you know, diolch fawr. Now cross the country to the West Midlands and Birmingham. It's a very nasal kind of an accent, mostly on account of all the industry that went on in that area. Cat Daly, who presents So You Think You Can Dance, is from there. And so is Ozzy Osbourne, you know. Sharon, where's the bloody remote? Yeah, that voice that he does isn't because of drugs, it's just where he's from. Scouse is your classic Liverpool accent. The Beatles are from there and so's Paul McGann. They were also made European capital of culture a couple years ago by the EU, so don't tell me that our culture, all right? Up into Lancashire and, you know, think of Christopher Eccleston or most of the cast of the Downstairs in Downton Abbey. Daisy, get those buns out the oven before they burn. Oh, Mr. Bits. So, across the Pennines to Yorkshire, it's a much kind of flatter accent from Lancashire and they cut off a lot of the words. So, I'm going to pub up hill. Think of Sean Bean from Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones. One does not simply walk into Mordor. So, in Northumberland and Newcastle, he's speaking a Geordie accent. So, you know, think of the Geordie Shore or Carol Cole. Remember, she got fired from the X Factor because nobody could understand a word she was saying. Or Billy Elliot. All I want to do is dance Bally, but me dad makes me box. Edinburgh is the capital of Scotland. It's a very soft, maybe a little snooty kind of an accent. Think of Ewan McGregor or Dame Maggie Smith as Professor McGonagall. That's ten points taken from Gryffindor, Mr. Porter. Glasgow is a much thicker kind of an accent. Billy Connolly and Peter Capaldi are both from there. They cut off a lot of their words, so uh, I haven't any butter, so I've got to go to the shop, you know. And so up to the very north, to the highlands of Scotland. Think of Amy Pond from Doctor Who, or maybe Sir Robert Burns. The best laid plans of mice and men, gang after glee. Now let's go to Northern Ireland, and it's all about the vowels with the Northern Irish accent like. So like, how now, brown cow? Liam Neeson is from there. I've got a very particular set of skills. I know he doesn't say it in that accent in the movie, but it sounds well cool, so like... 
And finally, Southern Ireland is obviously not a part of the United Kingdom, but I can do a Dublin accent, so let's just do it. Uh, it's a pretty classic Irish accent with a lot of assonance to it. So Sinead O'Connor is from there. Nothing compares. Nothing compares to you. That is all from me. Tell me if there's any British accents that I miss because I love a challenge. Don't forget to subscribe and thanks for watching. All right, so as, as you could see, I, I, I didn't count exactly, but I think she does 17 different accents and everything within the UK. So you see, it's just impossible for you to say that there is one dialect we can call British English, okay? You now I'm gonna do the same with American English, all right? I'm gonna show you a few video clips, I think two only, to show you that uh, just as within the United Kingdom, there isn't one dialect we can call American English, okay? So the first one is this one called Boston as a second language. We're going to see the video is supposed to be uh, uh, for humor, okay? So it's sarcastic, ironic, uh, but it does uh, feature specific uh, uh, aspects of the pronunciation in the Boston area of the United States, okay? So take a look. Welcome to Boston as a second language. Khakis, khakis, khakis. Khakis. Now, an easy way to remember this is you put your khakis in your khakis and not the other way around. Everybody got that? Good. Moving on. Go to talkboston.com to learn how to talk Boston. So there are, there are several videos like this one for, to, of uh, Boston as a second language, right? And in, in this one, it's the car keys versus khakis, right? So you can see that uh, what we would expect from an American English uh, uh, pronunciation would be to pronounce car. But in the Boston area, they drop the, this, this post-vocalic R and change the vowel from A to A, right? So it becomes ca, ca, keys, right? There are uh, other videos in one that he makes uh, uh, play with words with sharks, shacks, and shocks everything sounding the same, yeah? And there is one in which hat and hat, they also sound the same. It's characteristics from uh, this region, okay? Let me show you another one. The best telltale sign that somebody's from the Mid-Atlantic is what linguists call our split short A system. Short A's can either be pronounced A or E. A. a lot of people in the country use A before most consonants, like Jack's a badass but use air before M and N, like, let's jam, man. And this is why in a lot of northern cities, an introduction like this is pretty damn confusing. Ian, meet Ann. Ann, Ian. But here in the Mid-Atlantic, we have a much more complicated system of what short days are at and what short days are air. New York City has a closely related but different system. The basic rule for ours is A becomes air if it's followed by M or N, but also F, S, or TH, as in lamb, man, bath, pass, and laugh. Every other consonant gets a, as in lad, lack, latch, lad, lag, badge, pal, bang, lap, lash, bat, have, and jazz. The exceptions are the words am, and, and, ran, swam, began, and the past tense of win, when, like, Yo, Mike, were you watching when the Eagles ran last night? Dr. Seuss is I am Sam, Sam I am. Well, that don't rhyme for us. Also, this word is pronounced Ken, but the opposite is pronounced can't. And a noun is pronounced can, so we're like, yo, can I get a can of soda? Although we normally shorten it to Kai, as in like, yo, Kai have a can of soda? Also the words bad, glad, and mad are exceptions. They don't rhyme with ad, had, and sad. So a good test to see if someone's from the Mid-Atlantic would be to ask them to read this sentence. Is dad mad, sad, or glad? Only around Philly and Baltimore do those words not rhyme. Also, math don't rhyme with bath and path for some reason. Also, as, has, and jazz, they all end in a Z. All right, so the video goes on for uh, a little more, but uh, he's talking about uh, the dialect in, in an area called Mid-Atlantic, right? So uh, the area around Philadelphia and Baltimore, which is not very distant from Boston, right? You're all like in the Northeast of the United States, but this region is a little uh, uh, towards the South. 
But anyway, it has some very interesting characteristics, right? So in, in, his, in this sentence, he goes like, hey, Moik, instead of Mike, right? Where you watch when the Eagles win. So the past of win in, in that region is when, not one, right? As you would expect in uh, so-called American English. Then the, the, the next one is that glad matter said this. All these words should rhyme according to the standard general American English, right? But in that region, no, it's different, right? Then can I have a can of soda? I have a can of soda, right? And uh, uh, and, and talk, the, the verb talk in, the, in another part of the video, the video, he says how it's possible to say talk, right? And these are characteristics of that region to show that we just can't talk about one English, one variety of English called American English, right? I'm going to show you now a sequence of maps. And uh, these maps were done uh, uh, in, in the Department of Statistics. And what they did is they uh, sent out questionnaires uh, across the United States asking people some, some questions. And, and some questions were about language, right? Uh, about uh, word choice, about grammar, and somewhere about pronunciation. And uh, how, how to read these maps, the, the way to read these, these maps is this. You look at the colors, right, that are coded here, and within the map, uh, the stronger the color means that more people picked that answer in that region. And the softer the color, it means that not a lot of people, right? So the question here was, how do you pronounce this word, A-U-N-T? And the options were, we using A as in ant, or using A as in A, ah, right? So you pronounce this ant or ant, okay? And you see that most of the United States, very dark red uh, color, uh, almost throughout the United States, they will pronounce this word ant. Right, but there is this little region here uh, in the northeast that they will favor aunt, and this region over here near Chicago, right, and this one over here, that they will vary, right? They say I will use a ah when referring to the general concept of aunt, but a ah when referring to a specific person <laughs> by name, right? So you see variation. Now you can already see that these two maps they they both have red as a a a, a color to code answers, but this one very strong red, this one not very strong. It means that people favored the, the answer in red, but not as much, right? The question here was the first vowel of miracle. Do you pronounce it E, miracle, or E, miracle, right? And people favor miracle, but in a not very strong way, okay? What about these three words? According to a dictionary transcription, the first and the third would need to rhyme, right? Ah, marry. And the one in the middle, eh, Mary. But for most people, all three are the same, except, and there is this little region here that they say all three are different, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's the, if I'm not mistaken, it's the mid-Atlantic Baltimore, Philadelphia area, yeah? Now look at this, no strong color. And the question was, how do you pronounce R-O-U-T-E, right? And red is I can pronounce it either way interchangeably, which is like most of the United States. Blue rhymes with hoot, so they pronounce it root, which is in the Northeast. Little bits here, but very light. And green rhymes with out, so they pronounce it route, okay? A little bit over here in the North, Chicago area, some other areas here, but no strong answer, right? So a lot of variation, even within the same places. This is interesting. C-O-T and C-A-U-G-H-T, are they the same or different? For the east of the United States, most of the east, they're different. So cat and caught. But for the mid-central part and west, they're the same, right? Cat and cat. Uh, then pajamas. Paj pajamas or pajamas? The red area, they favor pajamas. The blue area, pajamas. Uh, the red area will favor to say coupon and the blue coupon. And you see no strong answers again, very light colors, right? Red here is grocery, as in grocery store, and blue grocery, as in grocery store. So again, variation. Do you say strength is the red one? Strength the blue or green, the G silent. Yes, you see, most of the United States, they say they pronounce strength. 
but it's it's not very dark and very strong, right? So this is just to show you the variation within American English, right? Now, what about the the all other varieties of English? Okay, here's a little video, little snippets to illustrate some characteristics of Australian English. Okay, one, two, three. G'day, my name is Josh. This is my mate Reese. G'day. Now we're from Australia, we love a good chat, mm -hmm. but not for too long. So what us Aussies have gone and done is abbreviated everything. Australia. Australia. Football. Footy. Tennis ball. Tenno. Biscuit. Bicky. Chocolate. Chocky. Chocolate biscuit. Chocky bicky. Mm. Mm. McDonald's. Macca's. Laptop. Lappy. <laughs> ACDC. Akadaka. Devastated. Defo. Definitely. Defo. Morning tea. Monos. No one has ever said that. I say that all the time. What time is it? Monos. Get a bicky. Afternoon. Arvo. This afternoon. Savo. Dinner. Din dins. <laughs> Breakfast. Brekkie. Service station. Servo. Petrol. Petty. Bottle shop. Bottle o. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> Bowling club. Bolo. Garbage man. Garbo. Postman. Posty. RSL. Ari or Rissol. Smoke break. Smoker. Registration. Regio. Aggressive. Agro. Pregnant. Preggers. Wollongong. Wollongong. <laughs> Swimming costume. Cozzy. Mosquito. Mozzie. Tracksuit pants. Tracking pants. Monday. Monday. Tuesday. Tuesday. Wednesday. Wednesday. Thursday. Thursday. Friday. Friday. Saturday. Saturday. Sunday. Sunday. Birthday. Birthday. Musician. User. U turn. Yui. You're from out west. Westy. Facebook. Facey. Vegetarian. Vegger. Cab driver. Cabby. Lipstick. Lippy. Sunglasses. Sunnies. Present. Prezi. Christmas. Chrissy. Christmas present. Chrissy Prezi. St. Vincent de Paul. Vinnies. The Salvation Army. Salvos. Cup of tea. Cup of. Is that British? <laughs> We are British. Avocado. Avo. Have an avocado. Have an avo. <laughs> Spaghetti bolognese. Spag bog. Bog. Do you call it spag bog or spag bowl? Bowl. I think there's two variations. Spag bog is poo. Underpants. Undies. Beverage. Bevy. Chewing gum. Chewy. <laughs> Toasted sandwich. Toasty. Methylated spirits. Metho. Turpentine. Terps. Fellow. Fellow. Poverty stricken person. Povo. <laughs> Husband. Hubby. Give me. Give me. Trying to. Trying to. Hectic. Heck is. Cigarette. <laughs> Ziggy. Tin can of beer. Tinny. Schnitzel. Schnitty. Ambulance. Amber. Fireman. Fiery. Cop. Copper. Bricklayer. Bricky. Tradesman. Trady. Umbrella. Brolly. Sick day off work. Sicky. Kangaroo. Roo. Champagne. Champers. Relatives. Rellos. Expensive. Exy. Brisbane. Brizzy. Derelict. Dero. Cabernet. Savant. Cab sap. Kindergarten. Kindy. I did write like a little... After smoker, I might go down to the bolo Savo for a schnitty and bevy with Tomo. Then I'll head back to the missus for din dins with the fam and watch some soapies on the telly. Hopefully the only way I don't get pulled over by the coppers because I don't have any rego. <laughs> we are so bogan. Hopefully you've learned how to speak Aussie, Australian, so you can have shorter combos, conversations. That's how to happen. Do you want to give a bit of a plug? Uh -huh. oh. All right, so uh, there are many differences uh, uh, from... Uh, uh, what we would call American English to Australian English, right? This that they presented is just a part of it, like abbreviating many things, right? But they are different in sounds as well. So uh, the, the, the Australian uh, variety of English has more vowels than a, a stand, supposed to be standard variety of English, right? There is one characteristic of vowels, uh, uh, that they tend to say uh, yesterday, for example, uh, they'll tend to say yesterday, right? So uh, snake, they're going to say close to snake, right? There is even this joke of the Australian man who was driving in the United States and he was speeding, driving too fast. And uh, the American cop stops the Australian driver, comes and asks, uh, uh, come on, man, you're driving too fast. Did you come here to die? And he answers, no, no, I came here yesterday, right? So uh, just to show you this, this uh, aspect as well. Uh, okay, I'm going to show you one more. And now it's to, again, it's a funny video, supposed to be humorous, but that uh, features some aspects of Scottish English. And again, within Scotland, there is the, a Glasgow accent, Edinburgh accent. So again, even within Scotland, we can't call one dialect Scottish English. But anyway, for us speakers of English as a second language, foreign language, uh, this gives us an idea of what is possible to occur in uh, a Scottish accent. Okay, so here we go. What's the buttons? Oh no, they installed voice recognition technology and us left the hell of it us. 
voice recognition technology in a lift in Scotland? You ever tried voice recognition technology? No. They don't do Scottish accents. Eleven. Could you please repeat that? Eleven. 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 Could you please repeat that? Eleven. Whose idea was this? You need to try an American accent. Eleven. <laughs> Eleven. That sounds Irish, you know, American. Not Disney. Eleven. Where in America is that? Dublin. I'm sorry. Could you please repeat that? Try an English accent, right? <clears throat> Eleven. <laughs> Eleven. You for the same part of England as Dick Van Dyke? This is yours on smarts. Please speak slowly and clearly. Smart house. <laughs> Eleven. I'm sorry. Could you please repeat that? Eleven. If you don't understand the lingo, a way back came to your own country. Ooh. Is that talk now, is it? A way back to your own country? Oh, don't start, Mr. Bleeding Heart. How can you be racist to a lift? Please speak slowly and clearly. Eleven. 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 You're just saying it the same way. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying it until I understand Scottish, all right? Eleven. 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 I'll just say it's anywhere you can. Just open the doors. This is a voice-activated elevator. Please state which floor you would like to go to in a clear and calm manner. Calm. Calm. <laughs> Where's that coming from? Why is it telling people to be calm? Because they knew they'd be selling us to Scottish people who'd be going out for nuts at it! You have not selected a floor. Aye, we have! Eleven! If you would like to get out of the elevator without selecting a floor, simply say, open the doors, please. Please? Please? Suck my wally. Maybe we should just say please. I'm not begging that for nothing. Open the doors, please. Please. Pathetic. Please remain calm. Oh, fuck! Oh, you went up tonight. Get him up now. I just wait for it to speak. You have not selected a floor. Ah, girls, you coward! You don't answer these doors. I'm going to come to America. I'm going to find whatever desperate actress gave you a voice, and I'm going to go in an electric chair for you. Scotland, you bastard. All right, so uh, you see that for our ears, right? Brazilians studying English in Brazil, that's a very different accent. And it shows uh, differences in pronunciation, but also in words, right? I don't know if you noticed, maybe you want to go back and watch again, but they use the word I, I for yes, I we have. The elevator says you haven't selected the floor and then it says I we have. I, they, I think they write it A, Y, which, which is for yes, right? Uh, the R is very different, right? So they say America instead of America, right? And uh, I have had uh, the pleasure of having the opportunity to, to be in Glasgow once for a conference. And I remember that the first day riding the hotel, checking in the hotel, I got surprised by the accent because I heard somebody saying... Uh, uh, there are there are there are three persons in the elevator, and I stopped and think, man, three persons. It's it's funny because if my Brazilian learners said three persons instead of three people, right, or person, I would correct their pronunciation. And this got me reflecting about teaching pronunciation and the goal and the model. And I'm gonna get to it, right? Uh, let me just show you a few more things and uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to this thought, all right? Uh, there, I have these two more videos to show you, which is uh, 
people making different accents, okay? Not to make this presentation too long, I'm not going to uh, play these videos here in the presentation, uh, but I'm going to give you the links for you to watch. Let me just show you the beginning of this one for you to feel what it's like. It's an actress. See, that's the problem. Oh, no, this one is, is a stand-up comedian. This one is, I think it's the actress. Yeah, she's an actress. Hello. And Hello, she does uh, the same sentence old, with different accents. Me. You're right, I'm Amy Walker. I'm 25 years old and I was born in London, weren't I? Yes, hello. My name is Amy Walker. I'm 25 years old and I was born in London, England. That's right. My name's Amy Walker and I was born in Dublin, Ireland. Hi, how are you? I'm Amy Walker. I'm 25. I was born in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Of course I'm Scottish. I'm a walker, aren't I? You know, walker like the short breed. Comes in the wee tin with a tartan on it. Buongiorno, my name is Amy Walker and I'm from Italia. So I think she does 21 different accents, native and non-native. And it's very interesting to hear the differences in melody and sounds and vowels and so on. Okay, I'll I'll share the link to take a look later. And this one is a stand-up comedian and uh, uh, he brings up some characteristics of uh, native English, uh, what, what we call British English, but also non-native English and the accents we carry. Okay, this one I'm going to play. Take a look. See, that's the problem, though. Here in America, when it comes to the English, we mistake accent with intellect, right? We think they're all smart because no matter what they're talking about, they sound quite intelligent. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. If we're talking about anything, be like, my belly button is quite itchy. <laughs> and we'd be like, that dude is smart. <laughs> but they're not all smart, okay? They just sound smart. They look dumb with the crooked teeth and the wacky hair. Oh, no, you go to England, some of those Englishmen have that elephant man look about them, like, oh, no, I look a bit frightening, but <laughs> at least I sound intelligent. <laughs> and the English, the English have a weird thing with the letter T, because sometimes they overpronunciate the letter like that, and sometimes they ignore the letter completely. <laughs> it's like, what happened? Where did the letters go? And there are two T's in the word letter, and yet they're nowhere to be found. <laughs> it's quite odd, right? No, no, like... You see, I understand if there was, like, one T, you just missed it, you know, that's fine, whatever, whatever. One T gone, fine. <laughs> but when there are two T's, you just skip over them like, that's just rude. <laughs> it's like the letters don't even matter. The English and their teas, they spend half their days drinking teas and the other half ignoring them. <laughs> but every accent, every accent has a weird relationship with one letter. Like the Russian accent, the Russians, they take the letter Y and put it between every other letter. Take any sentence, like, this traffic is unbelievable. They would say, this traffic is unbelievable. <laughs> I cannot believe it. You have been sitting here for 15 minutes. The Israeli accent, it's the letter, it's the letter M. They take M's, put it not between every other letter, between every other word. Um, I want them to um, go um, to uh, get them um, and... What do you want, a bag of M&M's? What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and then, of course, uh, then, of course, you have the uh, German accent, which uh, is just music to my ears. I, uh... Yeah, it's, I, I, they're crazy with the letter Z. They're crazy with the Zs. In fact, I ran into a German guy this afternoon. He was looking at me funny, you know? He was staring at me like... And weren't you the guy that I saw this morning at the coffee house? And I was like, uh, how do I get out of this? Um, <clears throat> oh, I'm uh, terribly sorry, but this must be a case of mistaken identity. <laughs> Thank you, guys. That was fun. Thank you. So again, just to illustrate uh, uh, possibilities, right, of pronunciation and sounds and so on. So this, this takes me back to my first question when I, I started showing these video clips, which is when you're learning English as a, a second language, as a foreign language, then what model are you going to follow, right? What are you going to teach or what are you going to follow? If, if dividing into American English and British English, you're ignoring so many other varieties. And even within those two, you can't really just um, say that there is one single variety we can call American English or British English what model are you going to follow, right? You need to follow something. And my suggestion is that for your production, 
or pronunciation in producing it, you need to choose one model, even if it doesn't exist, right? Even if it's like too, too simplified to talk about American English or British English, you need to pick one. Otherwise, your, your English is going to be Frankenstein. Remember the example I gave you of the Scottish English saying three persons? If you say, well, there are native speakers who say persons, so I'm going to say it. My answer would go, all right, fine. So, so um, uh, Scottish people say person, fine, you can say it. But everything else needs to sound as close as possible to Scottish English, right? Or suppose you say, oh, I, I don't want to say, I don't want to put my tongue between my teeth to say words like think, because in Indian English, they don't say think, they say think. My answer will be, all right, go ahead. But then all the rest of your English needs to sound as close to Indian English as possible, right? It's just like Portuguese. Imagine a foreigner learning uh, Portuguese and mixing pronunciation from Europe, from Brazil, from different parts of Brazil. This person is not going to be intelligible. So the goal for pronunciation is to be intelligible. It's for people to understand you. And the more uniformity you have in your pronunciation, the better. Take a look at my English, for instance. My English, the English I'm speaking is Brazilian English. I have an accent. People identify me as a non-native speaker of this language, and I'm fine with it. But at the same time, people can tell that my Brazilian English is closer to an American accent than to a British one, right? And I'm not aiming at a particular dialect of American English from New York, from Boston, Baltimore, from California. I'm just aiming at being intelligible within this um, uh, greater model, okay? Even though in, in for native speakers, it doesn't exist because there are there is so much variability, okay? Now, this is for production. You need to follow a model and try to be consistent. But here, here is another thing. You need to set realistic goals for yourself, okay? You, if, 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 you begin, if you learn English or if you go into learning pronunciation aiming at being a native speaker or sounding like a native speaker, you're going to be frustrated, first of all, and it's, it's, it's not realistic, right? Which native speaker are you going to be and why do you need to be or sound like a native speaker? You're not. You're a non-native speaker and it's fine. Having a good command of an additional language is something incredible. So why are you wanting to sound like a native speaker, right? So I don't want to sound like an American. I'm, I'm fine with being identified as a Brazilian, but I want to be intelligible. So I want to work in, with, in my fluency, grammar, vocabulary, and pronunciation so I'm as, as intelligible as possible to everybody, to native speakers and to non-native speakers alike. Now, this is for production. Now, for perception, I think the goal should be different. I think we should be exposed to as many varieties of English as possible. So we practice our listening skills, not in only one variety, but in many, right? It's very frustrating for somebody to practice uh, so much of one variety of English in, in listening and then try to watch something and not understand, right? So the more you listen to varieties, the better, okay? Now, to finish it up, I want to show you uh, a few of the things we're going to talk about, okay? We're going to talk about in this course about pronunciation a lot, right? We're going to talk about each and every consonant, vowel, and so on. But there are other things that are at play, when we uh, want to learn the pronunciation, right? And uh, some of these things have to do with writing. So the spelling system, and because we're, we, we read and write in our native language, we transfer some of the expectations we have, right? So the writing system already has some inconsistencies and we transfer some of the expectations we have from reading and writing our own language. And this can create some confusion and extra difficulties, okay? So I'm gonna show you just four examples, okay? Just to uh, go in a more practical manner at the end of this presentation. So I'll talk about letter sound correspondences. 
homographs, homophones, and silent letters, okay? So first of all, if you take a look at these words in orange in Portuguese, right? I believe um, it's, it's probable that you don't know the meaning for all these uh, two, four, five words in Portuguese, okay? They are not frequent words. But even still, every Brazilian can pronounce these words, and they will pronounce these words the same. We're going to say procracidade, flapilação, fumigação, tartarear, indenidade. No Brazilian would challenge the pronunciation of these words, even not knowing their meanings, okay? Nobody would say, oh, no, it's, it's procracidade, it's flabolação. No, nobody would challenge this, except for some uh, uh, regional uh, uh, colors of the pronunciation, but no one would challenge how to pronounce it. This doesn't necessarily happen in English, right? There are many words that native speakers have doubt in how to pronounce them because, because uh, Portuguese has a much stronger letter sound correspondence than English. And because Portuguese has a strong correspondence, it's not perfect, but it has a strong correspondence between letters and sounds, we transfer this to, port to English and end up mispronouncing many things, right? So these words in red are words that I have selected that, that are frequently mispronounced by Brazilians, okay? So the first one should be pronounced domicile. The second one is not preface. It's not a face before your face. It's preface. The next one could be admin, administrative or administrative. So there are diff, uh, different uh, possibilities to pronounce the same word. The next one is not distribute, as we would, would expect from our uh, stress system, but it's distribute. The next one, uh, Kendra, okay? The next one, I-R-O-N, is very frequently mispronounced. People want to say iron, but it should be pronounced iron, iron, okay? The next one, because of the E-A combination, some Brazilians tend to pronounce it steak, even though it's steak. The same thing with the AU combination. Most Brazilians tend to pronounce it gauge, but it's gauge, right? To, to measure. So in the car, the thing that shows how much gas you still have in the car, it's the gas gauge, okay? Uh, next one, because of the pH combination, some people want to say F for this combination, but it's haphazard. Uh, the next one, uh, like the traditional pronunciation should be mischievous. Even though I think, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's John Wells or David Crystal, I think it's John Wells has registered um, uh, native speakers saying mischief, mi mischievous also, right? The next one, because of the EW combination, some people want to say su, but it's so, like costura, yeah, to so. And the last one, utensil, right? Not utensil, as most Brazilians would say. So, just, just to, to illustrate a few words that are commonly mis mispronounced, okay? Now, what about the homographs? It has to do with spelling as well, and, and they affect pronunciation. So, homo, same, graphs, grapheme, letters, okay? So, same letters, but different pronunciation, different meanings. So, on the left, there are five words in red, all with the same ending, all of them ending in O-U-G-H but they're all pronounced differently, okay? And on the right, you have the pronunciation, the words that rhyme with them. So I'll give you a few seconds. Take a look at these words in red and think to yourself, which words in blue, which word in blue rhymes with each word in red? I'll give you the answer in, in 10 seconds. So the first one is pronounced bow, so it rhymes with cow. The second one is pronounced through, so it rhymes with true. The third one is pronounced although, so it rhymes with go. The fourth one is pronounced enough, so it rhymes with cuff. And the last one is pronounced cough, which rhymes with off, okay? Now, here are more examples of homographs, right? But with entire words, you have this word M-I-N-U-T-E, which can be pronounced in three different ways. It can be pronounced minute, as in time. It can be pronounced as in, it can be pronounced as uh, minute, as the minute of a meeting, like uh, a minuta of a meeting, right? And it can be pronounced minute, as in small, a minute detail, okay? 
B-O-W can be pronounced bow, which is like how Japanese people greet each other, or, or bow, as in a bow tie, right? Or you make a bow when you're wrapping a gift. W-Y-N-D can be pronounced wind, like movement of the air, or wind, what you do with a watch, for example, right? You wind and rewind it, or a winding road with lots of curves. And R-E-A-D can be pronounced read in the present or read in the past, right? Homophones, then you have homophones, same sounds. Now, same sound, but different spelling and different meaning, right? So here you have nine words spelled differently, but they are all pronounced with the same sound, E, okay? So you have e a w e e y i e e i e i o e e o all all these combinations for the sound e as in t meet key believe receive knees key people in phoenix okay and also homophones with entire words again right so you have two two different spellings and two different words pronounced sight two for mate three words pronounced two they're pronounced the same right and two for eight okay and silent letters, right? So English has uh, lots of silent letters sometimes. So the first one, uh, psychology, the P is silent, it's not pronounced. In the second one, amoeba, the O is silent or the O and the E make, make a combination, right? In phlegm, the G is silent. In mnemonics, initial M is not pronounced. In island and aisle, letters S are not pronounced. In singer, the, the G is not pronounced, not singer, right? You, you, you don't pronounce sing, so you don't do singer. Sing, so you do singer, yeah? Bomb, the final B is not pronounced. Honest, initial H, even though some initial H are pronounced, as in helicopter, yeah? Calm, the L is not pronounced. Committee, it's just an example to show double letters, right? So we have double M, double T, double E, right? And sandwich, the D is usually not pronounced, okay? So this was just, just to show uh, uh, a few aspects of uh, pronunciation uh, uh, to, to help you set a realistic goal for your own pronunciation and just to warm you up for the course, okay? So in the next video, we're going to do speech organs, all right? So we're going to start talking about uh, the actual production of sounds and uh, it's a very important video because we're going to use it to uh, get some adjectives that we're going to use to classify consonants, okay? So that's it. Uh, take care. Bye-bye.